Welcome all. So it is a pleasure and a great honor to have Professor Don Zaguier of Max Planck Institute and ICTP as a speaker in today's colloquium. So he, is, he has no need of presentation. He is a phantasmagorical mathematician, I would say. But on the other hand, to do a proper full presentation would need the full lecture probably. So I will make a compromise and mention <clears throat> just a few facts, which some of which may be uh, perhaps less well known, also personal. Indeed, I had the fortune and privilege to meet him uh, already in 1978, I believe, when I was a freshman, he was a guest of Professor Carlo Viola, whom we have the pleasure of having in the audience today. And uh, so uh, it was a great fortune for me. He was, he is this not- was here. He, uh, say this was, was here. In, was in, here in, in Pisa, Pisa yes, Paris. in Pisa, at, when I had just my second year freshman at uh, Scuola Normale. And uh, he's only a few years older than I am, but uh, uh, so he was very young, uh, not much older than me. And, but he was uh, really very much uh, advanced. Uh, by the way, he had graduated uh, already at 16 at MIT and uh, had, uh, had an amazing uh, knowledge and the skill with numbers and formulas. I was really amazed and uh, reminded me of Ramanujan in a way, uh, which is by the way, not, not complete uh, uh, stupid <laughs> association because also because of the interests, Ramanujan was very much expert in formulas and modular forms and uh, uh, Don Zaguier is probably has a knowledge, a unique knowledge of modular forms in that uh, world. Um, modular forms, let me stress then, they have had increasing importance in mathematics until very recently and uh, has have led to some of the most remarkable breakthrough in the whole mathematics. But uh, beyond Ramanujan, he had a knowledge which was mu much more vast. Ramanujan was a self-educated in a way and did know very little of uh, mathematics. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Zagier, uh, in addition to knowing th these topics of modular forms and so on, had an amazing knowledge also of general mathematics. He was a pupil of Hirzebruck and at that time, in 1978, he had already written a book with Hirzebrook, which I have the pleasure of having in my uh, home. I bought the book at that time. Um, a book was entitled The Atia Singer Theorem and Elementary Number Theory. It was a fascinating book pub published by an editing house called Publisher Parish which uh, is uh, has become increasingly more true. This publishing house indeed published and then perished. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, so he obtained several amazing results, uh, which I cannot even uh, uh, summarize. Uh, I uh, limit myself to mention the gross Zagier formula for the height of the Higner point, so-called Higner point in 1986, if I remember correctly, uh, which uh, in particular led to many, many important consequences, such as cases of the Birch swinnerton dyer conjecture, and led to the solution, complete solution of the effective Gauss problem on class numbers, when it is used together with the a former result of Dorian Goldfeld. By the way, Goldfeld also was a visitor of the Scuola Normale when he uh, had this uh, very original idea. 
So he, Zagie obtained also many important awards. Let me mention just the Kohl Prize for the Gauss problem, the Von Staudt Prize, the Chauvenet Prize for exposition and until and other prizes until recently, he had received the Fudan Prize in China uh, in 2021. He has been director of the Max Planck Institute for many years until recently he retired, but he is still a member of uh, Max Planck Institute and has been a professor at Collège de France from 2006 until 2014. And now he has also a distinguished position at uh, ICTP in Trieste. He has had uh, many, many distinguished, very distinguished students. So let me just mention two of them, both field medalists, Maxim Konsievich and Marina Vyazovska. With Konsievich, by the way, he started the important uh, and fascinating theory of periods. He has an amazing general knowledge, speaks a large number of languages, uh, I think more than 10 at various levels, but uh, at least he is recently learning Persian, I think, and uh, plays fantastic piano player, reads books of every other topic and has an enormous energy learning every other thing that he comes across. And uh, I just conclude by sh saying that he very generously shares his ideas and uh, time with uh, other colleagues and uh, interested persons. So uh, I conclude here and I give the word. So he will speak. Uh, the title is From Three Dimensional Topology to Quantum Modular Forms. So. Thank you, Umberto. Whoops. I assume you all realize that many of the very nice things that were just said are extremely exaggerated, but some of them are true. And you omitted my most recent honor. I was invited to the School of Normale to give the De Giorgi Colloquium. So this should be on, my, on the list of big honors. So I'm very, very happy to be here. As you heard, I was here already for a long visit, very successful, invited by Carlo Viola in 1978. And then on at least two occasions that I don't remember the year since. So every 10 or 12 years I come and each time it's wonderful and I promise to come very often and then it doesn't happen, of course. So my title today, of course I've forgotten, but luckily it's written right here. We just heard from three-dimensional topology to quantum modular forms. So as I wrote in the brief abstract on the poster, I certainly do not expect, in fact, I hope that most of you don't know either what uh, quantum invariants of three-dimensional topology are or what even ordinary modular forms are. I'll try to explain a little bit. But I want to start with something very, some very general thoughts. I'm looking if there's uh, here, good chalk, because the pieces there are very short. I'm also very short, but that's different. So I wrote in the abstract that there are many interactions between topology and number theory, or also reactions, or uh, uh, so I started life as a topologist, because it's hard to imagine now, you couldn't do anything else at that time in mathematics. I was an undergraduate at MIT, as you just heard, and I wanted to study number theory. In the entire time I was at MIT, which admittedly was only two years because I did it very quickly, there was not one single course in number theory. It's really hard to imagine today. Uh, and to make up for it, there were maybe 10 different courses every semester in topology. And when I told my professors, I was an undergraduate, I would like to do graduate work in number theory. Oh, no, no, number theory is dead. The last important work, sorry. At that time, as I said, it was considered impossible. People said with a serious face, number theory is dead. There was the work of Hardy, the work of Vinogradov, Civ theory, it's 30 years old. 
nothing more has been done. There's nothing left to do. You must learn topology. So I learned topology, became a graduate student under Atia in Oxford, and then I came, as, as uh, Professor Zanier told, to uh, Bonn and worked with Hirzebruch. And luckily, we started finding that there were connections between topology and number theory. There had already been connections 10 or 15 years earlier. One famous one, if there are topologists here, they will all know the uh, Milner's great discovery and later, later Caver Milner, exotic spheres, that you can take an n-dimensional sphere, which is a manifold, a smooth manifold, but it can be the same as the usual sphere continuously, but not diffeomorphically. So there are non-standard differentiable structures. This was a huge sensation. And it used number theory. It used the Bernoulli numbers. The Bernoulli numbers came up in classifying homotopy groups of spheres, uh, exotic spheres, and so on. So Bernoulli numbers are a very old theme of number theory. Then when I was a graduate student, I found a, a few small things. I'm not saying that was the next step. It was the next step for me. And in particular, so I already mentioned Bernoulli numbers, which will not reappear in this lecture. They should be called Seiki Bernoulli numbers. They were discovered independently by the Japanese mathematician Seiki at the same time. Then there were other things that number theorists know called Dedekind sums and related invariants. And already at that time, I found some nice formally relating them to topological invariants of the so-called breeze core manifolds, which were the main source of exotic spheres. So I wrote to Hirzbruch in, Bo in Bonn, and he invited me, and I became his student. And then we wrote a book together. I was going to say the title, but you already heard it. It was called the Atia Singer Index Theorem, so very, very high level topology and elementary number theory. So it went from, and the idea was perversely to use extremely difficult theorems of number theory and then deduce things of, of topology and deduce things in number theory that had much simpler elementary proofs. But in this way, you could see that they also were reflections of higher dimensional invariants. And then something that gave me great joy when you're young. One of the things that makes you very happy is, of course, if your supervisor or your superiors uh, like what you're doing or appreciate your work. But I had an even better experience. I actually had an influence on my advisor, on Hirzbruch. He was a very famous topologist. And I think partly through this book, which was joined, and through my formulas, he started learning number theory, made a huge breakthrough three years later, the so-called resolution of cusp singularities, uh, which led to very nice number theoretical facts, like Con connections that had not been seen between continued fractions and class numbers. And he invented the slogans. So I'll put, I'll just write here, book with Hirzebruch. So uh, on Atiyah Singer and elementary number theory. And then his work on Hilbert Mulder surfaces, which are four dimensional manifolds, but whose invariants lead to number theory. Uh, or use number theory rather. And he invented the slogan, which I liked very much, more and more number theory in topology. And this became his motto and kind of one of the mottos of the uh, research center that was the predecessor of the Max Planck Institute in, in Bonn and the whole group around him. So this was my background. And all of this was a one-way street that number theory, which is a very old field, was used in topology. So there were difficult questions in topology, and then you found that they could be classified by Bernoulli numbers. There were invariants, which turned out to be Dedekind sums and so on. Number theory was very old, very developed, and topology was, of course, there was much less. And so that was the direction. The theme of today's lecture from now on is that in recent years, from my point of view, there's an action the other way, that topology now leads to things that also have number theoretical invariants, but these are invariants that had not previously been seen. The Renoi numbers were 300 years old, Dedekind sums were 150 years old, 
uh, class numbers were 200 years old, continued fractions were 600 years old in some sense. But now there have been several things coming specifically from three-dimensional topology, which is very different from the rest of topology, uh, that have led to number theory, which is first of all much deeper. It's not elementary number theory. These are things like algebraic K groups, Abiro rings, and so on. I mean, much more complicated or much more sophisticated number theoretical quantities, but also several new things have appeared and in particular new kinds of modular forms. For me, this is particularly exciting because modular forms are my love, my, my life, if you wish. Almost all of my work is somehow connected. So in the lecture, I'll tell some of these things, but while I'm still giving the summary, maybe I mentioned recently, so this is the last maybe 15 years. The specific work I'll talk about is with Stavros Garofalidis. I'll write his name later. But roughly in three-dimensional topology, something very amazing happens. This was the great discovery of Thurston, for which, of course, he got the Fields, the Fields Medal, very much uh, super deserved. And he discovered that three-dimensional topology is not topology at all. It's geometry. So he discovered something. It wasn't completely proved. Part of it was conjectural and was finally proved by Perelman. But basically, he said that all three-dimensional manifolds can be built up of pieces which have a canonical geometric structure. So they have a geometric thing, a Riemannian manifold, has a length between any two points. You have a, a curve, and it has a length. In topology, you can move things around. There are no angles, no lengths. But he showed that these structures were completely unique, not just that there could be a metric structure, but exactly one and only one. And so everything became rigid. And as soon as things become rigid, first of all, it means they're only countably many. You can't deform. And secondly, it means you're doing number theory automatically, because it's rigid, then there's some group, maybe some Galois group, which leaves something invariant. So in, in a sense, Thurston's work in the 70s already showed that the, the story had to be full of number theory. And some of it appeared then, but some only much later. So Thurston's uh, big discovery was that this leads to, or actually is, the same as three-dimensional geometry. More precisely, he showed that every three manifold breaks up into pieces, so sort of well-defined atomic pieces, which have one of eight geometries, and one of them is much more important and much bigger than all the others. It's called hyperbolic. So roughly, you have non-hyperbolic, which are relatively speaking easy, and th these are the simplest manifolds you can write down, and then you have hyperbolic manifolds. It doesn't really matter what it is. I can tell you in one word, you take hyperbolic three space, which is the space discovered by Lobachevsky and Bolyai and also Gauss in the 19th century, the non-Euclidean space, and you divide by some group which acts discreetly, and then you get something that is three-dimensional, but it has a metric, because this thing has a metric. It's a, it's, it's a well-defined space. It has a curvature. The curvature is constant. It's minus one. And so the hyperbolic manifolds have a very, very rigid structure, and there are only countably many of them. So these, in a sense, are the easy ones. And here there are various ones, I'll just say them without writing, uh, quotients of the sphere, so things like lens spaces, the Poincaré sphere, uh, torus knots, Seifert manifolds, you don't have to know what any of these words mean, but these are manifolds you can write down much more easily. Sorry, is there a problem? So, okay, so just to finish this uh, summary where we're going, as I said, Topology now, or three-dimensional topology, is going to lead to uh, new kinds of modular forms. So I'll, I'll, of course, in a minute explain what the old kinds of modular forms are, what modular forms are, but I'll just say what the new kinds are here. This was work I did with uh, Ruth Lawrence in 1999 and alone two years later for specific manifolds. It leads to something which is already more sophisticated than ordinary modular forms. They are called mock modular forms. I'll explain briefly later what they are. But roughly, modular forms start with people like Klein, Poincaré. So this is uh, maybe from 1880 to 1930 with Hecke that the main theory was developed. 
Well, these things were invented actually in the doctoral thesis of one of my students, not a Fields medalist, Sanders Svekers, in 2002. So this is much more uh, recent. And this led this more difficult field. So this is the easier kind of manifold. And these will lead, this I'll speak briefly, as I said, to new modular forms, which are the quantum modular forms that I'll talk about, and a refinement that I call holomorphic quantum modular forms. So these were first written down actually by me in 2010 in a paper with no theorems, no definitions. It only describes this new concept and gives examples to say that it seems to be interesting, but it also gives uh, applications to things in algebraic K theory, construction of units in cyclotomic number fields or cyclotomic extensions of number fields, and new elements of what's called the Habira ring that I won't be able to speak about. This last part is joint work with Garofalid, as I also mentioned, uh, Peter Scholze, also a fields medalist in Bonn, and Campbell Wheeler, who was our student. So this is now kind of ongoing work. So in the lecture, I want to first tell you what modular forms are, classical modular forms, then briefly what mock modular forms are there. I won't give the examples specifically coming from topology, but uh, and, and then the interesting part, uh, the most interesting part is the quantum modular form, I mean, the least familiar. So let me start with ordinary modular forms. I'll always write MF for modular forms because it's too much work to write. So modular forms, we actually have two things. We have modular functions. So a modular function is a function, typically holomorphic, sometimes not, but for us, a holomorphic function of Z, Z is a complex number, but with imaginary part bigger than zero. So it's, it lives in the upper half plane. And then I'm sure many of you or most of you have seen that you have the group, uh, for instance, the group SL2Z, but you can also take other groups like subgroups of SL2Z. So two by two matrices, A, B, C, D, four integers with determinant one. And then the group action is Mobius transformations or fractional linear transformation. This is an action on the upper half plane. And the function, which is simply invariant under that, plus maybe some growth conditions that I'll drop, is called a modular function. So this is a classical theme going back to the late 19th century. So that's a modular function. And a modular form is almost the same thing. It's slightly more general. A modular form has a weight, which is usually an integer, sometimes a half integer. So we'll call it k. So a modular form of weight k has the same property that it's invariant. So it's again a holomorphic function of z. But you have to slightly modify the invariance to have cz plus d to the k times f of z. So this isn't very enlightening when you see it. But the only important thing you have to know about modular forms is that there are many and that we, in some sense, know them all. If you can show that something is a modular form, you know everything about it and have wonderful consequences. For instance, when Wiles proved Fermat's last theorem in the late 1990s, he used a theorem that had been proved a few years before that if a certain famous conjecture of Tanyam and Wei were true, this conjecture says that a completely explicit function associated to an elliptic curve is a modular form. Nobody could prove it. But these people before him, Ribot and his predecessors, had proved that that statement would imply Fermat's last theorem. So modular forms are an extremely strong object. If you have a function which belongs to this class, it has wonderful consequences, like in that case, Fermat's last uh, theorem. So, but, but at the same time, usually you can write down, oui, this is, okay, they do both move. So I want to give a few examples. I mean, they're the standard examples. If you know them, you've already seen this. This one doesn't have something to push. Okay. So I'll give uh, four examples. Completely explicit. Well, first I should say a little bit more. This group SL2Z is generated by two matrices, which are this one and this one. So one, one, zero, one, and zero minus one, one, zero. 
So this one simply sends z to z plus one, and this factor is simply one. So our function is automatically uh, periodic of period one. And the other function is sends z to minus one over z. So this alone is very easy. You can write down any expansion with any coefficients e to the two pi i n z. And since e to the two pi i is one by Euler, this function is automatically periodic, and we always abbreviate in this field uh, e to the two pi i z is called q. So this is written a n q to the n, just to save shock. So in this case, the transformation, so this is easy to do. You could take arbitrary coefficients and you have nothing. But now you add a second transformation law, which is that f is invariant under z goes to minus one over c up to this factor, a power of z. And then suddenly it becomes very rigid and they're only a small number and you can write them down and they're very beautiful. So that's roughly how it works. So let me give you the examples. So the first one is called E4. I, the, uh, four means the weight will be four. And this is E is for Eisenstein. And it's a somewhat unlikely looking expression if you've never seen it, but it's completely elementary. It's a power series in Q. As I said, it always should be one plus 240 times the sum n cubed times Q to the n over one minus Q to the n. So if you multiply this out, you'll see that it starts here Q plus nine Q squared plus 28 Q cubed plus 73 Q to the fourth and so on. And this number, for instance, is, the, is one plus three cubed. It's the sum of the cubes of the divisor. So it's already an interesting number theoretical function, not a very deep one. So this is an example, but this is a, a modular form of weight four. So first of all, trivially, it's translation invariant. It's invariant because it's a function of Q, which remember is e to the two pi Z. But what's not uh, obvious, it's not very difficult, but it's not certainly not obvious, is that it also satisfies this, and therefore it also satisfies the more general equation e4 of az plus b, etc., is equal to cz plus d to the fourth e4 of z for any two by two matrix. Another famous one, I'm just listing some of the most famous, hoping that many of you will have seen one or all of them, and therefore these will be familiar friends. So there's the Ramanujan function. So you multiply Q times the product one minus Q to the end to the 24th. So this uh, is an expansion and this has weight 12. So it satisfies, again, it's trivially translation variant, but delta of minus one over Z is e to the 12th delta of Z. There are several proofs, but none of them is really easy. One has to do some work. And then the next example is the famous J function. I want to give at least one example of a modular function because later some of our things will be modular functions. So E4 of Z had weight four. When I cube it, it is weight 12. Delta of Z also is weight 12. So the, quot the quotient is weight zero, which means it's simply invariant. So this is the famous uh, J function, a modular function. And its expansion starts like this. So you see that always we get numbers and that's basically why these numbers are important in number theory, these functions, because modular forms have expansions with typically very, very interesting number theoretical functions as their coefficients. In this case, it was noticed by McKay in 1978 that this number, if you subtract one, 883, this was the dimension of the smallest non-trivial representation of the monster group, which is the most uh, difficult, the hugest, the biggest of the sporadic simple groups. And this started a huge field of research, uh, so-called first monstrous moonshine and many, many variants, vertex operator algebras, a lot of conformal field theory. So a revolution in mathematics was started simply by the fact that a man, Canadian mathematician, my uh, knew well, well, John McKay, notice that this number is one more than that number. This number is very important in group theory. This number comes in multiple forms. He said it can't be a coincidence and it wasn't a coincidence. So again, one can be led by the number theory or the arithmetic of multiple forms uh, to startling discoveries. I'll give one example, one more, which is not interesting. These are some basic ones, but simply I'll use it in a few minutes. 
So here I said that this is true for all ABCD in SL2Z, which means two by two matrices with determinant one, integer coefficients. But sometimes you have a form that only satisfied for a subgroup. And also sometimes K is way to half. So I'll give one last example, which I'll use in a few minutes. Uh, G of Z is equal to the sum n greater than or equal to zero. No, sorry, n is not greater than or equal to zero. n is congruent to one mod six, so positive or negative. And then there's a sine minus one to the n minus one over six times n times q to the n squared over 24. This, by the way, also has a product expansion like this. I won't write it down. And then this function, of course, again, satisfies g of z plus one is g of z because it's a function. Remember, q is always e to the two pi i z. So any function, which is a function just of q, like this is automatically a function. Actually, it's not true because this n squared over 24 is not an integer. So actually, here I'm on a subgroup. It's actually a, a 24th root of unity. I'll use the notation systematically zeta n is the standard nth root of unity. So on the unit circle, uh, it's you, you take an angle 2 pi over n, and this is a to n. So this function is not quite invariant because of the 24 in the, in the exponent, but except for that, it's, it's essentially invariant. Its 24th power would be invariant. And you can't use minus 1 over z because this group is index 3, the smallest non-trivial element. It is z over 2z plus 1, and then it's some constant that I won't write down. Times g of z times 2z plus 1 to the 3 halves. So this is again a multiple form, but it's not quite on SL2z and it's not integral weight. It does weight 3 halves. But just to say that there's some variety, and as I say, this one we'll see in a moment. So that's what classical multiple forms are. And I emphasize, I want to emphasize again, the definition looks quite artificial if you just see it. I mean, it took 50 years for this definition to emerge as such an important thing. But these things are incredibly rich. Uh, here I could give one very small example. If you continue, this was noticed by Ramanujan in the, uh, I hope it's correct, in my, in my memory, in 1916 and proved by Mordell the year later and gave rise first to Hecke theory and later to Jacques Langland's theory. He noticed, he just computed Ramanujan, who was mentioned, the first 30 coefficients, of course, by hand. And he noticed that the coefficient, if I didn't make a mistake in my memory of q to the sixth, is the product minus 24 times 252 is minus 6048. There's this amazing multiplicativity, and it's true for all other numbers. If you take two and five and 10, you get the same. And so he, he conjectured that it was proved soon after. And as I said, this led to the whole modern theory of uh, automorphic forms, adelic representations, Jacques Langmuth's theory, and so on. So modular forms have this very, very wonderful property that on the one hand, they have an elementary description as just a power series with integer coefficients. You get a sequence of numbers, sometimes easy to describe, sometimes very difficult to describe. But because of the rigidity of the theorem, you can prove uh, very, very strong things once you have multiple forms, like the monstrous moonshine or Fermat's last theorem. So I gave two kind of major examples. So now I wanted to talk about the next kind, which, so the, now they're called mock multiple forms. Actually, I invented that word in a Bourbaki talk on, on Sveger's work, but the word mock, which means fake, was already used by in the famous letter that Ramanujan wrote to Hardy, his mentor, in January 1920. He died in April 1920, so it was his famous last letter. And he wrote very happy. He was actually very unhappy. He was, in fact, suicidal, and he was sick, and he was, in fact, dying. Uh, but at that time, he was very happy. He wrote, I've discovered a wonderful new class of functions. And they're a little like the classical theta functions, which are what he called multiple forms. And so I called them mock theta functions. And then he gave 17 examples, but no definition. There was no explanation what these 17 functions were. There were just 17 definitions. And nobody had any idea what they were, but he claimed various things. Some of those claims people could check, but they didn't really know what the class was of which he was giving examples. And I think he also didn't know. 
uh, specifically, I'm sure he didn't have the formal definition that later Zwegers found, but I'll give the example, the first example of his 17 is the following function. Well, if I'm very correct, the motor form should be a function of Z. And so, but I'll write it as a power series in Q and actually once again, there's a power, a fractional power, which is again 124, this time to the minus. So I'll call that capital F, but F of Q, the actual thing in Ramanujan's letter to Hardy was the sum n from zero to infinity q to the n squared divided by one minus q times one minus q squared up to one minus q to the n. So this is a special function of a sort called hypergeometric functions. And what we now know, and he showed that it had wonderful properties, uh, well, not wonderful, but surprising properties. One of them he wrote very explicitly, if I take e to the power pi epsilon over 24 times f of minus e to the minus 2 pi epsilon. Then it has the following asymptotic expand the beginning. There are more terms, but actually he only gave this much. This function, when epsilon goes to zero, blows up exponentially like e to the pi over 24 epsilon. That, if I stopped here, would be exactly a classical modular form because that's this f of minus one over z is equal to f of z here with the power, which would be a half. But it doesn't stop here. The part that makes it non-modular, it's there are further terms in epsilon. I'll just put a little over epsilon. And Ramanujan gave this. There's an extra four that completely destroys modularity. And so he this much he gave, but nobody knew what kind of function would do this until, as I say, Sandra Svekers worked it out. And it turns out that what actually happens in this case, I can write it down on the same on the same board. Maybe I'll remove these functions that I don't need anymore. If you take the function, now I have to look at the formula because I certainly don't remember it. If I take f of z plus one, then of course it's again f of z by the same periodicity again with the z to 24th inverse for the same reason as before because of this, of this factor here. So that's obvious, but if you take uh, f of, I hope I'll get it right. If I don't, don't doesn't matter because uh, nobody is, well, it is being recorded, but we'll forget if I made a mistake. So what happens here, oh, now I can't read my handwriting. What you get is essentially, it should be 2z plus one to the one half f of z, so that would be a modular form. And then there's a correction term, and the correction term is roughly, there's a constant and maybe it's slightly off. The correction term is an integral. That he, he didn't know. This was found essentially by Zwegers. Uh, there's a correction term, so it's not modular, but the correction term is very simple. It's an integral from zero to infinity of a function g, and it's exactly the function I wrote down here. So this is a function we do know. So somehow it's like a second, it's a filtration. You have things that are ordinary multiple forms and then Mach is a bigger thing. Actually, they're second order Mach multiple forms whose failure of multiplicity are first order and so on. So this was already a, a new discovery and something very exciting. And as I already said, I won't give those examples, but if you look at the topological invariants, uh, I'll mention them in a second, their names, they're called the Kashaev invariant and the witten resha deacon derived invariant, these are quantum invariants, so defined by, in principle, some, by some quantum field theory, by some kind of a path integral, but there are also rigorous mathematical definitions. If you compute those invariants for specific three manifolds, where you can compute them, but these are not the difficult class, it's not the hyperbolic ones, it's the non-hyperbolic ones, then typically you find mock modular forms. So this is already beyond ordinary modular forms, but in the world of topology, of three-dimensional topology, this comes from the quantum invariance of, uh, of these two things. I wonder if one of the other erasers makes less of a mess. No, it's no better. There's no clean eraser by any chance? Apparently not. Okay. This I don't really need, so I'll remove it. So now I want to continue to the now that's the one I've been using and it, it makes a mess. It's very dirty, it doesn't matter. Uh, 
ah, those look safer. Yeah, okay, just leave them here. Oh, oh, ah, oh, you see. Yeah, the German system, the board is very clean, but the lecturer is very dirty. At the end, there's chalk and water all over the lecturer because you wipe with water and then it, it rains on you. Some people can do it well. Hitz could give a lecture in a suit and was impeccable afterwards. When I do it, I'm covered with mud. So I'm actually quite happy you don't have the German system here, even though I don't want to say anything bad about Germany. Okay, so... So now I want to come to the quantum multiple forms, which was the theme of you know, what, what I actually want to get to. I'm keeping an eye on the time. I think I started around 10 past four. So I've talked, uh, I don't know, 35 minutes, something. So the quantum multiple forms, this was an idea I had based on experiments. And the experiments, actually everything in this field is based on experiments. You compute some of these invariants, and then you sometimes discover amazing properties. And then you say, is there a class of functions that has those same amazing properties? And it turns out, yes, there is a class. And so at the end, you don't even care necessarily about your three-dimensional example. That just led you to find a new class of objects. So the quantum multiple forms, which was a paper I wrote in 2010 with that title. And as I already said, there, it's a paper with no theorems and no formal definitions. It, it, it's an approximate definition of what one means. And the idea is very simple. You have a function, but now it's no longer from complex numbers to uh, complex numbers as it was before, f of z. It's now a function still, maybe complex, it can be real valued on q. So therefore, since usually z is x plus i, well, I'll just call it x. y is now zero. So you can think of it, and in some cases that's correct, as the limiting value of some truly multiple object as you move towards rational points. And then the whole action of the multiple group should somehow be reflected. So here, we could say a multiple function, there could also be a weight, but I'll drop the weight. So I could require that this is equal to f of x for all a, b, c, d, let's call this thing gamma, so I don't have to keep writing it in SL2z. That would be a true modular function, but unfortunately SL2z acts transitively on rational numbers, so this function would essentially be a constant. I mean, it's completely uninteresting. So now we do something else. We say we have required that this is not equal. But that's a little too weak, because just a function that doesn't satisfy anything, that's nothing. So let's say if f of x if f of gamma, this is usually called gamma of x, the operation of this matrix on x, f of gamma of x is not equal to f of x, but there's, let's call it an error term or a discrepancy. So, so far I've said nothing because I can just define our gamma of x as this. But now comes the exciting thing. f is just a function, well, it's complex, but I'll pretend it's real. So here's x and here's f of x, I'll draw a graph, but x is not a real number, it's only a rational number. The rationals are dense. So when I draw the graph, I just get a whole bunch of points. There's no kind of regularity. It's just a collection of, a countable collection of points. But when I draw the graph of R gamma, then something amazing happens. It suddenly becomes an actual function on the reals. So at this point, I would like to show, just to make it more lively, the first slide or perhaps the first two slides, one after the other. This is for a very explicit example I've written down the formula for this particular example, but the formula actually adds very little. So just believe me, there is a function f of x given by an explicit function of q. It's in the so-called Habera ring, and you can compute it at every rational number. And when you do that, the graph, which we can now see, or maybe this takes a little while. The, I don't, the hg, the second one. Yeah, so, here, no, don't, don't, don't change it, please, until I ask you to. Okay, so yeah, so here is a graph, and you, as you see, it's kind of like I drew. The graph is completely, well, we also have this thing in the middle that's a little hard. Okay, no, now it's gone away, though. Now we have nothing. Yeah, that's why I never use slides. Thank you. Okay, so here you see the graph of this function. It's a complete, no, just leave it. Can you stop moving? I can't concentrate. You see that the graph of this is just a mess. There's nothing to be said. It's just a bunch of points. But now we take f of x in this, no, don't go away, don't go away. I, 
you know, I need the next one in one second. Which is just, just okay. I mean, I don't know how to push these buttons because I've never used these these machines machinery. So now we look at the difference. It happens to be f of x minus f of x over two x plus one, like I just showed you. And now it's a complex function. So here I graph the real and the imaginary part. For the other, I didn't give both because since it's a random set of points, there's no point seeing two random sets of points superimposed. It would just be denser. But here you see h of x. Uh, I can write it here. Maybe I'll pull this. And I hope it's at least partially visible for the, for the zoom. So f of x is something roughly. I've forgotten the details. But it's maybe there's a power of x. I don't remember. But it's roughly f of x plus h of x. So this h, which is the second graph, is the error, the failure of modularity. This function is terrible. This graph is a mess. This function is terrible. This graph is a mess. But the difference of the two graphs suddenly, and here you can prove it. You see here the computer had trouble. There weren't enough rational points here. There's actually a singularity at minus a half, which you can guess from this. But except for that, this is an analytic function. It's actually C infinity, even at minus a half, and it's analytic everywhere else. So this is the quantum modularity phenomenon. So now I'd, but you can leave the computer because I'll write on this for two minutes until I get to the next slide. So this is the first example, and this was the notion of a quantum multiple form, which meant the function is a function only defined on rational numbers. It's not a holomorphic function of complex numbers in the upper half plane. It's only on the reals, it's not even on the reals. It's only on the rationals. It is a completely random graph as a function. It doesn't interpolate to R. But when you take its failure of modularity for any element in the group, then it suddenly becomes a smooth function. So that was the first example. But the second one is much more interesting. Maybe I'll show the slide first, and then I'll give you the formula. So first, I'll just say a word. This example actually is related to a mock modular form. The next example will not be, it's this new kind, I mean, this truly quantum multiple form. It comes from the quantum invariant of a three manifold, which is actually the complement of a knot. So we just call it quantum invariance of knots. I'll draw the knot in a minute as soon as the screen goes away. So it's a very, very explicit function. No, I'll, I'll say when I want to know. Uh, it's a very explicit function, which I'll write down in a minute. And that function, again, the graph is, a mess, but it's not like the one I showed you before. It's a bit different. But when you take the difference of the uh, to uh, of the that function and its thing, it becomes much better. So could I now have the next slide? Excuse me. Don't please stay here. But just uh, so it will be the first slide of Enigma, the bottom, bottom, bottom of the page. And so to see, yeah. So it's. This is taken from a paper, so it wasn't prepared as a slide. But here is the graph of this function. In this next case, you see it has much more structure than the one before. But still, it becomes blacker and blacker. It's not a graph in the usual sense. But here you take, well, this is logarithmic because the numbers are actually 10 to the 50. So it's the log. So I take the log of the ratio. J, it's called j, j of x over j of minus 1 over x. And suddenly, it becomes an actual function that extends more or less to the real line. But as you see, it's not a continuous function, let alone analytic. It has jumps, actually it has jumps at every rational point. So this was a big enigma. Why did this example lead to the same behavior we had seen from the others, but then not quite the same because uh, this function was not smooth. So in the paper, I chickened out and just said, well, I define a quantum modular form as a function on the rationals where the difference f of x minus f of gamma x has better analytic properties than it used to. For instance, it becomes continuous or nearly continuous. And I said, I won't specify because the different examples are different. But it turned out there's a beautiful answer. This was work in the last four or five years with Garofalidis. So I'll show you in the next slide in a minute. Uh, no, not yet, uh, just a second. You, you can sit here. You're not in my way, but I have to still say something. So what turns out is this, this function, which I call j of x, it is a function, but actually it's only one entry of a two by two matrix. So it turns out there's another function and a third one and a fourth one. This function is called the Kashaif invariant. I'll give you the formula in this case in a minute. 
but it's an invariant that always exists. But we found in this work with Gaudi Falidas, I'll write his name on the big board, that actually there are four functions, they form a two by two matrix. And actually, even that two by two matrix, there's a bigger matrix, which is three by three, which is an extension. So actually it's a three by three matrix whose first column is one, zero, zero. And J of X is just this number. So let me call this thing J, well, it should be matrix, but I'll pretend it's a vector, J tilde of X. So this J of X is just one entry, let's say the upper left-hand entry of this two by two block. Now, as you know, even the most beginning undergraduate knows when you multiply two matrices, you don't just multiply the entries. So if I, what I should be doing is of course to take J of minus one over X and divide it by J of X, but the whole matrix. When you divide one matrix by another, the upper left-hand thing is not just the ratio. So what I drew here is the ratio of the upper left-hand entries of two matrices. Of course, it's a bit random. But now, if we can see the, the next slide, once you know that the you can do this, this matrix will again have first column one, zero, zero. It will have six more functions. And there, there are pictures. Well, there are 12 because they're complex. They have real and imaginary parts. And here is the picture. And you see there are a bunch of, of pictures. But now all of the functions have become perfectly smooth. So this is what we now call a matrix valued quantum holomorphic form, but in the very strict sense that the quotient is now suddenly an analytic function. So you jump from the world of completely random functions on the rational numbers to functions that are completely real analytic, except for a finite number. Here it's at zero of jump points, zero and infinity in this case. So then that's now I'm finished with the slides. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to be such a nuisance. So, so this was, as I said, only a couple of years ago, but now I wanted to show you the formula first, but because of the screen, I had to wait slightly. So as soon as it comes back, I'll say what actually is happening. And also I can use these wonderful fresh erasers now. So again, I'll tell the story briefly. The quantum invariance, there are two kinds. A three manifold has a thing called the WRT, that's Witt and Restitik and Turaif invariant. I'll skip it. It also gives equally nice examples of all of these phenomena, but a knot. So a knot is a picture. I'll draw you the simplest knot if I can do it. It's called the figure eight knot. So you take this picture. So with any luck, that's a knot. This is called the figure eight knot. Uh, actually, its formal name is 4-1. It means it's number one on the list of knots with four crossings. And so I'll give that example. So if you have such a knot, which is contained in S3, then you actually look at the complement of the knot. That's a three manifold, but not a closed one. And it has a different invariant called the Kashaif invariant. And I'll say very briefly how that goes, because many of you will have seen some of the ingredients. So certainly the topologists or people who have had, had seen lectures on knots will have heard of the Jones polynomial. So Jones got the field medalist basically for discovering this thing. If you have the knot, it has an associated polynomial called the Jones polynomial, which is a polynomial with integer coefficients. Actually, it's not quite a polynomial. It's a Laurent polynomial, so a polynomial in Q and Q inverse is computable. And then there's also the, so this is called uh, sorry, it's not in this. It's in this. It's the JK of Q is some polynomial, and more generally, they're the colored. This was done afterwards. The colored Jones polynomials, uh, JK n of Q, which are also elements of this. N is one, two, three. For one, it's trivial. For two, it's the original Jones, and the higher ones, you do something with the knot. You take somehow n copies. So there's a sequence of polynomials and they're completely computable. So I won't tell you the definition, but if you give me a knot like the 4-1 knot, you can compute it and I'll tell you what it is for the 4-1 knot just so that you ha have an actual formula. And if you like computers, you can even program it in five minutes and play with it. The nth polynomial is a finite sum because it's a polynomial. It's Q to the power minus NN times the product 
we should remove this because it's times the product. I don't remember the form, of course, by heart. J from one to M of one minus Q to the N minus J. I hope I'm getting it right. If I get it wrong, it doesn't matter. Then you just change it in your head to whatever is correct. So it's some formula like this, but it's a completely explicit formula. So you can compute it for n equals one, two, three up to infinity. And by the way, it's kind of nice. You can also make the sum go to infinity. Same thing. Because as, as soon as m is bigger than n, then one of the terms here will be j equals n, and then this thing is zero. And so it's actually, although it's, it's an infinite sum that actually terminates, which is why it's a polynomial. But now if you compute this thing, then you find that if, if you now take Q to be zeta, which is an nth root of unity, either the one I had before or any nth root of unity, then you find from this formula very easily, it's true for any knot, so I won't write that, the value of this polynomial at zeta has period small capital N. It's periodic. So therefore, if you, okay, but now, something very remarkable happens. If I do this for the four one knot, and I take n to be one, two, three, up to, let's say I take z to be z to 300. So the standard 300th root of unity. Then if I take the first 299 values of this function, uh, all of them are less than 25. So in, the, in this case, if z to z to 300, then jn of zeta, it's always positive from, from the formula, it's less than 25 for n from 1 to 299. But jn of j300 is 5 times 10 to the 45. It's a completely different order of magnitude. It's exponentially big. And then since it's periodic, the next ones are again less than 25. It just So it's small, then there's a huge peak. And because of this periodicity, this big number, the only one we care about, jn, is equal to j2n, but I can therefore interpolate backwards and just call it j0. And so we have a function, but now if you think of it, j0 of q is now actually the infinite sum, one minus q times one minus q squared up to one minus q to the n, absolute value squared. But this sum is always divergent. If q is less than one in absolute value, these terms converge to a non-zero constant, the infinite sum diverges. If it's bigger than one, they also diverge. If it's equal to one, they diverge. But if q is a root of unity, now it converges for a stupid reason. If q is a root of unity, say a 10th root of unity, then once n is bigger than 10, there's a factor zero, and so it stops. So it's a finite number, but it's only, it's intrinsically only defined at roots of unity. It simply doesn't make any sense. And so if I now define my quantum model form, j of x, script j of x, be j zero of e to the two pi i x, to say that q is a root of unity, a to the two pi x exactly means that x is in q. And so if x is in q, q, the small q is a root of unity, this thing converts and makes sense. And that's the function that I showed you the graph before. It's this function, j of x. Except that, as I just told you, j of 1 over 300 is 10 to the 45. And they didn't give me the whole universe as my blackboard. And so I actually graphed the log because it would be too big to see. But the graph that you just saw is this function. And so this function is a quantum modular form. But it's a weak one in the sense that I showed you. The graph of j has all of that uh, black thing. The ratio j of x over j of 1 over x is much better, but it still had those facts. But then, as I told you, j of x is actually just one component of a 3 by 3 matrix. And then if you take that matrix and divide, it's, it's a completely holomorphic thing. And you get a nice smooth function, which are the six functions you saw. So now I come to the very last bit, and also the last bit of my time. Uh, it turns out, and this was a complete surprise, that there are also functions in the upper half plane that are related to this. So somehow this function, which was only the rational numbers, lifts in some strange sense into the upper and lower complex half plane. As it's not quite the limiting value, but it's, well, it is basically that. And so I'll just tell you the story very briefly because it's amusing. My colleague whose name I've said several times, I would write down that we did all of this work. It's in the poster, but I haven't yet said it. Stavros Karufalidis. And our works in China, uh, 
he, at one point, we were coming back on the train from a conference in Switzerland to Germany, and he asked me about a completely different function that had nothing to do with, with anything, which was the function, I think I remember the formula, if I get it wrong, again, it's not very important. I think it's this, it might be plus n over one minus q times one minus q to the n, this time squared. And he asked if I could say anything about the asymptotics of this. But it turned out that if you, I've actually meant to say, but didn't yet say, I already told you that this function is j at one over n, which remember was the value of the original j zero at e to the two pi i over n. I told you it's exponentially big. It looks roughly like e to the constant times n. This is true for every knot, but that's a conjecture. It's the main conjecture of modern uh, quantum invariance of three manifolds. There have been whole conferences about the 30 years of the Kashai volume conjecture. So for general knots, we don't even know that it's true, that it's uh, exponential growth, but here we know all about it. It's n to the three halves. The constant is essentially the volume of S3 minus k up to some normalizing constant. And then there's a, a function, uh, which I can write down the beginning. It starts, well, the constant term is one over the fourth root of three, and then it continues one plus 11, times, I can put it like this, 11 over 36 squared of three times pi over n plus 697 over 36 squared of three squared, so I think 7776, uh, pi squared over n squared and so on. There's an entire asymptotic expansion with extremely new surprising rational numbers which appear, which are all there for new, not invariants. And so this was a function we'd been studying that came up in this refinement of the, uh, and this is only the case when Q goes to zero, you have something similar when Q goes to any root of unity and you get the whole modular group acting. So this is part of the quantum modularity story, but you see appearing a power series. So my friend Gary Felidis had, he had seen this function in a completely different context, nothing to do with topology, so-called quantum spin networks. And he asked me for the, asymptotics, and we found on the computer it was very hard to do because they were, uh, it was uh, oscillating. There were terms that oscillated, and so you had to look at the frequency. But when we finally sorted it all out, what we found, to our very great surprise, is that this thing was equal to the square root of epsilon, I may get some constants wrong, phi hat of epsilon plus the square root of minus epsilon phi hat. So there were two exponential terms. And this phi hat was e to the uh, c over epsilon with the same c that we had before, that same volume, but now with an i, which is why it's oscillatory. You have a term e to the i over epsilon, e to the minus i, and then the same series. And I said there's an amusing story. Uh, Uh, the same thing, exactly the same series that, that we had before with epsilon instead of pi over n. So the amusing stories, we found this numerically. We found the oscillations. We did an approximate Fourier expansion to find the frequency. And my friend recognized the frequency was 0 0.30236. And he said, that's the normalized volume of the 4-1 knot. It was the same C. We didn't know this was going to happen. And I recognized one number, and it was 697, which is the one I just wrote. But I couldn't remember that I said, I saw 697 somewhere. So I went to my computer and I typed in the correct directory, grep 697 star. And then there was one 697 and it was this coefficient and then all the other coefficients matched. So this was a discovery made completely by accident using the computer, but later it's, it's, this is now proved. So the point is that this function Unlike the thing before, the previous function was also a function of Q. The previous function was also a function of Q, but remember it was given by a divergence series, it's still written down, the sum absolute value one minus Q up to one minus Q to the N squared. Sorry, can you, it's very distracting, sorry. The previous function was a function given by this form, but it only converges if Q is a root of unity. Otherwise it's divergent, it makes no sense. But this function converges in the unit disk, Q less than one, which means imaginary part of Z is bigger than zero because Q is always as E to the two pi I Z. So suddenly we have a function in the upper half plane. And now this function 
turns out to be an example of what I said before. It's a, like a modular form, but it's now what we, so the final word, and then that's the, the last new concept. We now call them holomorphic. I'm going to change the word. It's a terrible name. Holomorphic quantum modular forms. And what it would mean if it were true is that G of minus one over Z, it's not invariant in the upper half plane. If it were invariant, it would be a modular function because it's translation invariant. But this is some function that extends. And this is the new point. So please. So here, Z is in the upper half plane. Minus one over z is also in the upper half plane. The difference, these are both holomorphic functions. So the difference is, of course, holomorphic. And I've said nothing. It's not like for q. For q, each function was a random function. And the difference became much smoother. Here, each function is already holomorphic. This difference is no better behaved analytically in the upper half plane than it was. But there is a way to be more analytic than analytic, more holomorphic than holomorphic. And that's to be holomorphic in a bigger disk or in a bigger domain. And so what happens is that G of Z is only defined in the upper half plane. But if you cut the plane, this is what's called C prime, if you cut the plane from zero, infinity, this function is of course defined in the upper half plane, but now extends holomorphically to the lower half plane and the right line. So it extends to a half plane. And that's what we now call quantum holomorphic multiple forms. Again, it's not entirely true here. I simply lied because that's what we thought would happen. And what would have happened if the previous thing had been correct and that curve had been smooth, then this function, once you take the part on the real line, would be exactly the function that I graphed. But remember, that function was a function that looked like this. It, it had many little jumps. So it can't be a holomorphic function. And what actually is true is the same story I told for the Kashaif invariance is true here. There's a three by three matrix with G of Z and then something else, six holomorphic functions. The, top, the first row is one zero zero. The other three rows have uh, two rows, uh, two columns have six functions. G of Z is just one of them. And if I call this G tilde of Z, then G tilde of minus one over Z times G of Z, well, I have to invert one of them, is holomorphic. Of course, it's a holomorphic matrix value function. So M2, I guess, uh, M3 actually, of holomorphic functions in this cut plane. So all of the coefficients now extend holomorphically. And if you take the, the one in this position and take its values on the right line, which are now well-defined, they agree with the other one. So we have two papers, each is 100 pages, mostly conjecture, which produce new co-cycles. But then the big surprise at the end, you get the same co-cycle. So one comes directly from the Kashaif invariant, which is the, the one I wrote here. That's an invariant of the knot. And the other comes from a completely mysterious in general, unknown Q series, so a function that actually converges in the upper half plane. And this is this new property of quantum modularity. So I'll just end by saying that there are several examples now of quantum modularity. And I'll just, so the third one, the most the quantum, holomorphic quantum modularity, so this new thing. So the mock modular forms all have that property. You can show that. These matrix valued not invariants that I just talked about. But both of these are a little sophisticated, but there's an actually very easy one, and I'll end with that. At the very beginning, when I gave examples, now I've forgotten where the new eraser went. When I gave examples, of uh, multiple forms, I started with E4, which was the sum n cubed times q to the n over one minus q to the n. If I take E3, then in general for Ek, you have put n to the k minus one, I put this. But it's very well known to all number theorists that the Eisenstein series are multiple forms for weight four, six, eight, and so on for even numbers. And also for weight two, there's a slight modification. But the odd ones have no modularity properties. That's what we thought. But now it's known because of our work, but also uh, uh, Trapeau and Betin approved, at least for a special case, that the odd weight Eisenstein series, which are completely elementary functions, have the same property. If I take E3 of Z of minus one over Z, if it were modular, it would be Z cubed times E3 of Z. There is no modular function of weight three. It's not possible. But if you take the difference, then it extends 
holomorphically to a half plane. So this amazing extension property is true, and this is a very, it's not very hard to prove. It's a very, very surprising uh, property. So this opens up in principle a whole new class of, of such functions. We have a few other examples coming from Fadier for quantum dialogues and so on, but I couldn't explain in any way the time is gone. So I'll stop with that. Thank you very much for the fascinating lecture. So, questions or I, comments? I hope there are questions. Obviously, you're extremely free to ask it at any level. So, yes, there's a question in back. Yeah. Wait, wait. I can see. No, it's, it's actually quite. Yeah, sorry. Uh, do we know or conjecture a way to single out among all the quantum modular forms those which have the holomorphic property? Oh, uh, wait. Uh, it doesn't, the question actually doesn't make sense. The quantum modular forms are defined on Q. Yes. The holomorphic quantum modular forms are defined on the upper or upper and lower half plane. So if you have such a function, you can look at its asymptotics as you approach all rational points, but it might not have any asymptotics. So it might not give you a classical quantum uh, quantum modded form in the sense of a function on Q, although all the examples I know in fact do. And conversely, if you have something on Q, it doesn't have to come from anything, but they're very hard to construct and all the examples I do, I know, do with that. So the answer is in practice, all of the ones that we know are both. Whenever we have an example of one of these two classes, so if it's a function just to find other rational numbers, but so f of x, where x is rational, but f of x minus f of gamma x extends to some nice function, that's what's called the co-cycle, then there's actually also a function of the upper half plane, f of some other, f tilde of tau, such that f tilde of gamma tau minus f tilde of tau, which is another co-cycle, agrees with the first co-cycle. So in practice, they always come together. I don't think, that, I wouldn't even want to make a conjecture that it always happens, that doesn't make sense. We, the concepts are only a year or two old. We have a tiny number of examples. There's no point conjecturing about all the examples that will be found in the future. But the examples I know always have both properties. And one could even include in the definition that you have both, that you have behavior at rational points and this holomorphic extension. But since they're kind of disjoint properties, I thought one should keep them separate. And maybe I'll add one word for people who, who know this word. Certainly most of you, most mathematicians know the word distribution. Relatively few people know the word hyperfunction. A few people in this audience know it extremely well and are smiling. But a hyperfunction, roughly a, a distribution is something that you can integrate against a smooth function. And a hyperfunction is something you can integrate against a real analytic function, the real line, very roughly. And what's happening here is that if you consider the function in the upper, but a hyperfunction you can always see is the difference of two holomorphic functions in the upper and lower half plane. And so here, if you think of this function here, g of z, I didn't tell you, but there's a, a mirror, a, a partner in the lower half plane. So this is really in the upper and lower half plane. It defines a hyperfunction. And then the property that it extends roughly says that it's an invariant hyperfunction. But there's a subtlety involved, it's not quite true. So the correct name for this should be modular Hyperforms, but if I called it that, then nobody will want to know what they are. So, so I didn't do it. So, so thank so, you. That was an excellent question. So, if I understand it right, we don't expect that they every object of that one kind comes from one of the other kinds. Well, as I say, it doesn't really make sense. Let's say we're that back a hundred years ago, and people have found a few examples of manifolds. They've discovered what a manifold is. It's locally smooth. They know surfaces, and they know a few other manifolds. You know, spheres and so on. What's the point at that point of, of conjecturing, for instance, the Poincare conjecture that there are no exotic spheres, which people would have conjectured. After 50 years, you have many examples and you find that some things would have been too naive. We just don't, we have just a, a definition and a certain number of very beautiful examples, which suggest that there is a general concept. You can write down the notion, but to talk about all things. For one thing, maybe it's not quite the right notion. Maybe we have to tweak it a little, add a little more, some property that we haven't noticed that they all have. And maybe when you add that property, then you get more. But 
we're, we're still feeling in the dark. So to me, it's not a reasonable thing. Certainly there's no conjecture because only I or Garofalidis and I could make this conjecture because they're our babies, so to speak, and, and we certainly wouldn't dare. And there's just no, not enough evidence. It's, it's a new object. But it, that these objects exist is clear. And then finding that, for instance, the alt weight Eisenstein series, which have been around a long time, that seem to have no modularity, our examples tell us that these things will be showing up. By the way, mock model forms was the same when Zwekers found it. So what he did in his thesis in 2002, he took this famous letter of Ramanujan with the 17 examples, found the common property that those 17 functions had. And then he defined a club. Well, he didn't give it a name. He said, let other people name it. So I named it in a Bourbaki talk about his work, the mock modular form. This was the class of functions of which Ramanujan 17 mock theta functions were examples. And at that time, there were basically only 17 examples. Now there are dozens. I mean, of, of other kinds. It's become, and they're higher weight multiple forms, and it's really exploded. But when you start, you don't know which way it'll go. We, we couldn't have made, we wouldn't have been able to guess the right conjectures. So it's, it's just too early times. Thank you. It's a very natural question, but ask me again in 15 years when I next come to Pisa. Further questions? Well, I have one. Can you tell me uh, about the number like uh, 796 that appeared as a coefficient? 796, I don't... You 697, 697. 697. Yeah, yeah, to me they're very different. See, I'm a number theorist. Do they have a meaning uh, regarding uh, knots? Uh, knots? Well, each coefficient, by definition, is a knot invariant because the whole Jones, yes. the Jones polynomials are already topological invariants. That's known. Therefore, their extrapolation backwards to n equals zero is a knot invariant. Therefore, its asymptotic expansion is is a knot in, a topological invariant. In other words, you compute it by triangulating this three manifold. But if you take a different triangulation, you get the same numbers. So it's an infinite sequence of operations. These particular numbers, eleven and six ninety seven, we do know. I'll just say one word, but I refuse to even try to define it. If somebody's interested, they can ask me separately, but it's too technical. There's a wonderful thing called the Habiro ring that was found about 30 years ago by topologist, Japanese topologist Habiro, that a lot of topologists know, almost no number theory knows. A few, Mani knew it, I discovered, and uh, uh, Peter Schultz knew it, but it's pure number theory, but it hasn't become famous yet in number theory. It's a wonderful object. And what we've seen in the joint work I mentioned with Peter Schultz, Agarofalid, Campbell Wheeler, is that there's a generalization of that. And all of these functions give examples of elements in that generalization. The definition is still a bit fluid. We keep improving it from month to month, but we have examples. So therefore this specific series with the coefficients 1, 11, 697, it's actually 697 over two if you normalize correctly, these numbers are the expansions of a power series that's part of the realization of an element of a Habira ring, in this case of Q of squared of minus three. So there's always for every knot an associated number field. Here it's Q of squared of minus three. Remember, I had a two by two matrix. The size of the matrix is always the degree of the number field. And we now are beginning to know how those invariants look. So it's a fascinating new that's I mentioned at the very beginning, another new thing in number theory, but it's not finished yet, is Habira rings for number fields, as opposed to the original one, which was just associated to Q or to Z. And so all of these things, almost by definition, will be in that because the definition is motivated by these examples. So the coefficients, the individual coefficients, of course, have no special meaning, but the function as a whole is the expansion of an element in a ring, which we think is, has very interesting and very uh, deep properties connected also with uh, Durham cohomology and uh, piadic things and so on. There, there's, there are many ways that this Habira ring can be interpreted. So there's a lot of number theory in the background, but thank you. I couldn't tell it. So further uh, questions? I, there is one. In the end, yeah. But the other entries are still obtained by Yes, uh, but as I said, the paper is 100 pages. The paper, we start with the Kashaif invariant, which is known. We look at this asymptotic expansion. I gave it to you just at 1 over at epsilon. But then you can do it at a half plus epsilon, a third, so at every point. And then you discover the quantum modularity. And then you get new things with new asymptotic series. 
then you find ways to compute those asymptotic series numerically, even though they're divergent to a certain accuracy. Then you subtract that. And then you find that what's left is again an asymptotic series, but exponentially smaller, the sub-exponential term. And so you get further series experimentally. And then when you keep doing this, it's a kind of resurgence. After a while, you don't get anything new. And those functions that we produce, but it's many, many pages of successive experiments and successively subtracting what we've already discovered from what we have, we keep getting new invariants. And at the end, there are only, in this case, six of them, and they form this uh, two by three matrix plus the trivial column one zero zero. So they are not invariants. We can define them by this procedure, but it's a conjectural definition. Numerically, this procedure gives a well-defined thing if it gives anything at all. But as I said, even the volume conjecture, which now it's been erased, but this function started e to the c times n, even that is a conjecture for most knots. It's only been proved for 20 knots. So the rest of the series, it's all guesswork. But on the compute, you get these numbers to very high precision. So you know they exist. You can't prove it. So there is a procedure that leads to further invariance. And we conjecture, of course, will work for every hyperbolic knot. We checked it for about three or four different ones. And each time is a very long story. So it's, it's more than conjectural. It's conjectures about objects whose definition is even conjectural. But you can check it numerically on the computer to very high precision. So yes, the whole matrix is a matrix of, so it also answers your question. It's not just one topological invariant. It's a whole matrix. And then this matrix actually has this quantum modularity property. So it's a subtle thing. By the way, both papers are on the archive. Actually, I think they're both to appear quite soon. So if anybody's interested, you can, if you look at Garif Ali Sindhi papers of the last two years, you'll find the two and the whole story is told there, but it's a long story and the papers are unreadable. Thank you. So, thank you very much. So there are no further questions. Let us thank again for this really marvelous lecture. <laughs>